So thank you very much, Heidi. Our next presenter is Brian Lyles from NSF. Brian's going to talk a little bit about the uh, CCNIE program and Sorry, I can't talk and plug at the same time. Thank you. And uh, Chip, uh, I, I'm glad you're, where are you now? Ah, I, I'm glad you're uh, helping us with uh, and focusing on, on where next. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the relationship between NSF and the GPO is rather different than the relationship we have with you as individual PIs. Uh, the, uh, the deal with the GPO is a cooperative agreement rather than a grant. This means that we get to both harass the GPO on a uh, weekly and in sometimes a daily basis, uh, and at the same time, uh, they give us a lot of, of good insights as to how the community is doing and what's working and what are the fundamental community needs. Uh, and I uh, deeply appreciate uh, the work that, uh, uh, that Chip and the GPO have done and are continuing to do. And I get to harass Mark on a daily basis on the operational side now. So what I want to do uh, today is tell you about uh, the awards that we made under the CCNIE program. Last time I stood up in front of you and talked about CCNIE, uh, the solicitation had just appeared, and about all I said was, go look at the web uh, and read the solicitation. I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, that was in March. In July, we were uh, in the process of paneling the uh, proposals, and clearly, you weren't going to hear anything. Uh, as of today, the awards are public, and uh, it seemed worth stepping back and telling you, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, about them and uh, what uh, 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 we did. Now, uh, for those of you who went to the Internet 2 uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago, uh, you will recognize some of these slides. Uh, uh, my fellow program officer over in OCI, uh, Kevin Thompson, who was the, uh, who's the primary uh, uh, program officer for CCNIE, uh, produced the majority of them. Uh, I added a f uh, edited and added a few, but uh, 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 Kevin uh, is very definitely on this. It's worth remembering that uh, NSF has been in the in the communications infrastructure business uh, in one way or another at some, at some level for, uh, uh, well, since, since NSFNet. Uh, the high performance uh, uh, computing backbones, uh, the VBNS, uh, the uh, IRNC, the international backbones, all in support of uh, the broader NSF community uh, the, the scientists who use communication as part of their scientific uh, process uh, has, uh, has continued since the, uh, the days of, of uh, 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 NSFNet. Uh, what, did not, what was not present was a, uh, the last mile, the campus connection, uh, and uh, starting in uh, 2010, 2011 uh, w was when the reports were issued. Uh, there were a series of uh, workshops and feedbacks to the NSF saying, you really need to think about uh, that last mile to the, uh, the, the campus experimenter because having uh, tens or hundreds of gigabits in the backbone doesn't help if you can't get it to the, uh, uh, into the core of the campus. Um, these reports led to uh, the uh, campus cyber infrastructure, network infrastructure and engineering uh, solicitation. Um, 
it was released March 1st of, of 2012. I, I told you about it at the March uh, GEC. Uh, it had two areas. The first one was fundamental upgrades uh, to the campus infrastructure for the purposes of, of, of bringing uh, gigabits to the experimenters. The second area was uh, innovation in the network uh, infrastructure itself. Uh, uh, the network integration and uh, applied innovation, uh, what are the technological or protocol uh, or, or uh, innovations that we need in order to, uh, to make this work. Uh, the proposal showed up on uh, May 30th. Uh, now, the thing that I want you to remember is the dollar figure uh, on that top, that, uh, that line. This was the originally anticipated amount. As you will see, we overachieved. And part of that overachieving was this, uh, uh, this community's uh, uh, input and, uh, and help. Um, there were the, the, the Area 1 uh, uh, amounts were up to $500,000. Uh, Area 2 was up to a million dollars. And uh, the proposals universities, it shouldn't surprise you. Uh, the thing that the slide doesn't say is the solicitation said over and over and over again, uh, your core campus networking people, your core CIOs have to be involved. Uh, this was not a, uh, a, re a one researcher going off and, and, and doing things. This was, we're upgrading the whole, we're upgrading the campus. So, some bullet points on, on uh, area one, uh, uh, and uh, 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 essentially upgrades within the campus to bring uh, the, uh, uh, the high, high capacity capabilities in. Uh, science DMZs are uh, a uh, architecture that has been evolved by the uh, e-sciences crew, think LHC, uh, the, the, radio, the various radio astronomers, the others who need to move terabytes or petabytes of data around. Um, area, area two uh, is essentially thinking on about how do you get end-to-end -end, uh, connectivity, uh, how do you make all of this work together. Uh, and uh, I've got a couple of bullet points that drill further down into these two areas uh, that the Genie community uh, should have cared about. So in area one, uh, there was a couple of critical points, one of which was uh, data scenarios uh, dealing with uh, uh, dynamic uh, circuits. So uh, how do we, how do we uh, provide open flow or VLANs dynamically within the campuses, the infrastructure to provide that. Uh, the second portion was providing, uh, making certain that we had an infrastructure for doing end-to-end -end performance uh, measurements built on systems such as Perf Sonar. And I, uh, that has been a, uh, one of the concerns of this community. Uh, Personar has been built uh, via a combination of, of NSF, uh, both size uh, and OCI, uh, the, uh, and the DOE, and I believe NASA had some funding. Um, area two, um, I, I think that first bullet speaks for itself. It's, uh, hey gang, uh, demonstrate, uh, uh, use this infrastructure for demonstrating next generation networks. And uh, Genie and FIA, SDN, all of these are terms that, that, that you uh, know and know well. 
and uh, the uh, experimental deployment of new networking protocols and technologies, well, that's what this community is about. So let's go to the stats. Um, we got 89 proposals. Uh, there were 39 awards over 34 different institutions, 23 states, and 21.6 million total funding. Now, remember that originally, uh, the original funding amount. Uh, size uh, joined in with OCI, uh, with the exception of the uh, with the exception of a panel that was run while I was away, uh, I was on, sat in on all the panels and looked for funding opportunities uh, where size could co-fund the, uh, the OCI uh, programs. As Kevin said, we had an opportunity-rich environment. Uh, with the additional $3 million from size and some additional uh, money uh, from OCI, uh, we got to 21.6. Uh, uh, area 1 had 21 awards, Area 2, 18 awards. Uh, in the course of, of thinking about what size was going to co-fund, uh, I use, uh, loosely used these uh, criteria. Uh, uh, supporting the ongoing Genie uh, engagements uh, by connecting Genie-related uh, infrastructure. Hey, how do we get the Genie racks and other Genie uh, infrastructure connected up to the national backbones such that we can run uh, dynamically uh, configured experiments? Uh, the uh, proposals that, that talked about Genie uh, that, that recognized that Genie was going to be, <clears throat> be an important use of the infrastructure, um, that described experimentation that was going to be enabled uh, via Genie and, and the CCNIE funding, uh, that was developing uh, protocol implementations that this community might directly use, and finally, just in general, if you ended up with the dynamic virtual circuits uh, that uh, supported the uh, computer science department, I said, you know, even if they didn't mention Genie, I'm certain that you will end up using them for Genie. <laughs> so with that, here's the award list. It's uh, public, on the, on, and I'm not going to read them. I'll let each one stay up for just a, a minute. Uh, many of you in this audience were uh, parts of various of these. And with that, uh, I'll conclude what uh, uh, I was kind of expecting Irwin to say. He didn't, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's worth mentioning in the context of, of this award. As um, some of you know from the, the uh, announcement out of NSF, we're anticipating that OCI will become part of size uh, once a budget uh, the, the budget process uh, uh, has resumed for FY13. Uh, the integration of size as uh, size and OCI provides an enormous opportunity uh, for uh, future infrastructure uh, and thinking about how uh, research, infrastructure uh, all come together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, it's really wonderful to see you know, an unfolding collaboration between um, Genie and, and CCNIE. We're going to take a little bit of a, a shift um, towards uh, 
great. I put away the window I needed. I take a little bit of a shift towards um, international collaboration now. Um, Ruslan Smolyansky from Moscow uh, is going to come speak a little bit about a, a budding new collaboration. And uh, in spite of the fact that we, I, I want to acknowledge we are, are running somewhat late, I'm going to ask people to stay um, a little bit into the break uh, because Peter Steenkist is going to uh, give a demonstration of XIA and will also be showing off a somewhat more mature international collaboration as, as we reach into uh, Japan for, for that demo. So give me just a moment to get these slides up and, uh, and Ruslan will take it away. Uh. Thank you very much, Chip. Thank you very much, Mark, for this great opportunity to make this presentation. Uh, so uh, I choose uh, the title uh, of my presentation uh, from Rudyard Kipling. I hope everybody of you remember from your childhood uh, the uh, Jungle Book. Uh, and the inhabitants of jungle apply to each other with these words, we be of one blood. And these simple words make easier their communication and cooperation. And this is why I use this title for my presentation. So what I am talking about, I will talk about some initiative in Russia and I would like to uh, describe briefly in general what is going on in OpenFlow SDN research and development in Russian Federation. And first of all, I should start uh, uh, with explanation. What does it mean, Skolko? Because it's a very uh, important initiative of uh, Russian government. So November uh, uh, 12, uh, 2009, uh, the former Russian president, Mr. Medvedev, he announced the development of the Skolko Fund. So uh, the main idea of this fund is to, so if, say, uh, informally to find the uh, environment, uh, uh, ecology, where uh, people can generate and bring some innovation, which is a, uh, one of the uh, big problems in Russia. So uh, on this slide, you see the Skolkovo mission. It's a mission of the Skolkovo Fund. Uh, you see uh, that uh, uh, one of the main uh, point of this mission is to be a gear which will help bring uh, uh, IP property from academical environment to the industry. But a little bit later, a Russian government recognized that they also need to make some efforts in order to speed up generation of IP property too, and because of that, uh, uh, within, so initially uh, the partner, uh, the member of Skolko project was a uh, spin-off startup companies in order to uh, develop some uh, products uh, um, bring on the market. But later when uh, our government recognized the lack of IP property, uh, the decision was made about to develop the applied research center. So the Skolkovo project split on several uh, so-called clusters. You see five clusters here. So it's energy, IT technology, biomedical, uh, uh, space, and nuclear research. And uh, uh, within IT clusters uh, 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 was initiated uh, the project uh, Applied Research Center for Computer Networking, which I am representing here. So uh, these uh, four main perspectives of the activity of this organization, this is a non-profit organization. So it's a research, education, industry cooperation, and uh, uh, universities, education. So on this slide, you can see the organizational chart of uh, uh, Applied Research Center. So, uh, uh, the first perspective is cooperation with the best uh, uh, scientific research center. And right now, we are in a partnership with the 
uh, Open Network Laboratory, which is joint laboratory of Stanford and Berkeley. And we are in a partnership with the uh, uh, Fraunhofer Society from Germany. So uh, uh, from this collaboration, we try to get the best uh, uh, practice how to organize uh, uh, research and in order to bring this experience to the Russian universities. So the next perspective is the next perspective is uh, working with Russian universities, and we arrange with the Ministry of Science and, uh, and Education of Russian Federation that uh, 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 we will be, uh, let me say, some sort of experts in an area of uh, open flow SDN technology, and we will uh, generate some list of projects, topics for uh, the possible research in this area, and Ministry of Science and Education will support uh, uh, this uh, project within Russian universities, because first of all, we have to uh, initiate research groups in the Russian university. Unfortunately, the faith of networking in Russia is not so uh, uh, successful. Uh, let me explain you why. Uh, initially, uh, uh, networking was uh, uh, started to be developed in the uh, uh, Soviet Union almost at the same time like in the United States. But in the 70s, the main international partner for Soviet Union definitely was not to be a DARPA. It was International Standard Organization. And you know, in the uh, 70s and in the 80s, uh, international standard organizations and uh, 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 ARPANET, it was a two different stream which developed two different uh, protocol stacks. And, uh, for example, uh, I, was, uh, I participated in international networking school in Italy, in Trieste, in uh, uh, 1989. Uh, it was an international school, and we spent the whole nights uh, discussing, it was a very hot dispute about who will win, TCPIP or uh, open system interconnection uh, 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 model. So then perestroika happened, come to Russia, everybody forget about science, technology, etc., etc., etc. And when at the middle of the 90s, people finally started to think about education, science, technology, etc., they found on the market a lot of product, product in a, a TCP IP architecture. So those groups, uh, researchers who existed at that time, they, their experiences was nothing they disappeared. And now it's a big, uh, uh, one of the mission of Applied Research Center to initiate this research again in uh, uh, Russian universities. And uh, the third perspective of our activity definitely is because we are Applied Research Center is uh, uh, um, working together closer with uh, uh, industry. And on this slide, you, you, see, you can see the long list of organizations uh, with whom we already in cooperation and drive and run uh, several projects. On this slide, you can see just uh, uh, some examples. Uh, we run a very ambitious project with uh, Rostelecom. Rostelecom, it's the biggest Russian uh, uh, telecom uh, operator. And they have a very ambitious project uh, to develop the net of data centers in order to generate uh, the uh, uh, very uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, services uh, for uh, public services for uh, citizens. Uh, the next, uh, our uh, very interesting project is uh, with EMC, uh, where we uh, investigate and try to develop some approaches how we can virtualize uh, storage resources in network. You know that virtualization is a hot uh, uh, topic, uh, uh, virtualization of network resources and virtualization of storages. and. Uh, uh, Storage is a very specific resources, so you cannot use the same technique, the same approach uh, like uh, we use for virtualized memory and network resources. 
So we try to develop the approach in this area too. Uh, finally, uh, we have very interesting uh, a project with Intel, which uh, trying to develop uh, uh, mm, SDN uh, open flow switch uh, based on the product, products of Intel. So uh, what our current activity, because uh, we just take off four months ago, so what we have been done and where we are right now. So we mm, organized several uh, schools for Russian universities about open uh, flow and SDN technologies. On this slide you see a lot of pictures about that. Uh, uh, right now you see our uh, uh, resources which we uh, used. So uh, we have a team. 20 engineers, uh, several PhDs and PhD students. Uh, so we are responsible for the development of uh, the special educational program for engineers and researchers, and we are also responsible for the development of the educational resources uh, in the Russian uh, uh, Federation for um, open flow and SDN technology. We also uh, made a, a big effort in order to be connected to an uh, uh, international network, and now we um, connected uh, to United States through uh, uh, Amsterdam to Cordis, and so now we uh, have the opportunity for collaboration with uh, uh, some projects within uh, Gini initiative. And I also had a meeting with the deputy of Ministry of Science and Education of Russian Federation and uh, uh, he agreed to uh, financially support such sort of uh, collaboration and uh, I also uh, know that uh, National Science uh, Foundation uh, uh, is going to support uh, such sort of co collaboration too. Uh, so, on this slide, you uh, you see some of uh, 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 some sort of proposals, uh, our vision in what direction we can collaborate. So I don't have enough time in order to um, uh, discuss every point on on this slide. So let me just uh, 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 put a few comments on several uh, points on these slides. So, uh, first of all, I would like to comment uh, about uh, the special protocol which should provide communication between uh, application and, uh, 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 and controller. Uh, because uh, when we, uh, so, when some application uh, is going to transmit di data to another uh, application, so, uh, he it would need to tell not only what to transmit but also need to explain how this application would like to tr to transmit this uh, 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 data so first of all it's a uh, question of the quality control but also uh, there are another side of this problem if we will think about uh, cloud computing and emerging cloud computing with a uh, service-oriented architecture where some application will need dynamically find some other application within uh, 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 some scope of application. So in order to be able to do this, we need a special uh, protocol. The next area is um, uh, distributed real-time simulation environment. You know that uh, in 1995 uh, 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 was developed high-level uh, uh, architecture standard in order to support the uh, in order to support uh, 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 the development of the complicated simulation model in networking environment. But unfortunately, so far, so uh, more than uh, 17 years later, we don't have the time management services in this uh, uh, implemented uh, 
uh, for these standards. And uh, we believe that uh, OpenFlow and SDN uh, bring a new opportunity in order to implement uh, real-time management for high-level architecture standard. And we also have several um, uh, uh, vision uh, of several points for research in order to develop the mathematical foundation um, in this area. First of all, uh, build a simple and adequate formal model for OpenFlow SDN network behavior. Uh, design formal languages for specification uh, of slices and network behavior, uh, properties like uh, correctness and uh, safety. Reduce this task to the conventional problem in applied logic, like uh, satisfiability checking and model checking. And finally, study decidability and complexity of this problem and to develop efficient decision procedure. Because uh, this is my third visit uh, on Gini conference and on uh, demo session I, uh, uh, when I apply to some researchers who demonstrate some solutions and when I ask here, them uh, what is the complexity of your algorithm? Why do you believe that uh, this algori algorithm will be good uh, in a broad area. So unfortunately so far I didn't get the clear answer. And this mathematical foundation research would be help us to do this. And uh, I also asked Chip to uh, uh, say uh, who I am uh, uh, and uh, I would like to show you my lovely slide. Thank you very much. Okay, Peter. So, oh, as I said before, I would ask people to bear with us, recognizing that we are um, working into the break, but um, there's a, a great group uh, from the XIA project at, at CMU. Um, they've got a really neat presentation and a demonstration. Uh, it's important that we know about the XIA project, which has been um, using Genie for quite a while now, routinely, um, in their uh, XIA validation and testing. It's important that we know about XIA because it's an exciting new architecture and I think it's particularly exciting uh, to see this new deployment of XIA that stretches across the Pacific to Tokyo. So uh, please hang in there, Peter. Great, thanks. thanks. Okay, actually, while, uh, uh, while they're setting up, I just briefly want to correct Mark. I think he suggested I was actually going to run a demo. I'm not going to run a demo. Um, actually, I have two uh, students here who are going to run the demo. Uh, so Matt Mukherjee and um, um, David Naylor are two students at Carnegie Mellon who've been working very, very hard in the last week plus to um, put the demo together, to be together with uh, Dan Barre, also from uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we also uh, had help in a lot of help from and have some incorporated some of the contributions from uh, 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 Cody Duchef from uh, Boston University, uh, Michel Machado from uh, Boston University, and Robert uh, Grandel from uh, um, University of Wisconsin. So uh, a lot of people contributed to the demo. Um, so the, the procedure is that I'll give a very short overview uh, of XIA. Um, the, um, and then I'll basically hand it over to, to uh, uh, Matt and David to talk about the, uh, the uh, to uh, run the demo. So uh, XIA is one of the um, uh, future internet architecture projects that are funded by the National Science Foundation and we're very grateful to uh, NSF obviously for their support. So um, a little bit of motivation. So one of the things I always like to do in a, in a future internet architecture talk is to give credit to the, to the current internet. Um, and um, obviously, you can't argue with its success. And I think one of the, the, the reasons for the success is really kind of the fundamental architecture, which is based on an hourglass model, as, you, as many of you know. 
But we've also been observing that the, 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 the narrow waste of the internet today is introducing some, some challenges that are very difficult to tackle. And, um, so these include things like security, which I think we're all uh, aware of. It's also hard to evolve the narrow waste. Um, and um, and uh, one example of that is that the internet is a host-based communication, provides host-based communication, even though virtually no applications care about hosts. They care about services and content. And then finally, um, the contract between the, uh, the network and the endpoints, which is really what the, the IP architecture does, um, is actually very limited, and that's also um, becoming an issue. So I'll present a couple of ideas that we have and that we're exploring in XIA to fundamentally address these challenges. And so let's see where I can get this to work. So there's the, the first of the three ideas that is that instead of being able to send packets to just hosts, uh, which is the model in the current internet, you can send uh, packets to different types of entities, okay? And I'll call these things principles. So um, what's important here is that even though I'm going to use uh, um, uh, endpoints to identify the different types of principles, what is fundamentally different between the principal types is the fact that they uh, have different forwarding semantics uh, inside the network. So this is really about how the network handles these, uh, these destinations. So quickly to go through them, we still have host identifiers similar to the current internet. So that really means that you're sending a, a packet to a particular uh, piece of hardware, a, a particular network attachment points. We have service identifiers as well, and the difference with hosts is that services can be replicated. So you can have multiple instances of a particular service, and we're giving the network the flexibility of picking the one that's the best one in terms of being the closest or whatever. And then finally, we also have content uh, principle type, uh, which differs from the above in the sense that content can be uh, opportunistically cached and potentially very, very um, uh, massively cached. And so the network may have many, many choices for, uh, for delivering uh, the, the, the content that is requested. Uh, on top of that, we have autonomous domains as well, which we are using for, for things like scoping and, and hierarchy, as, as, um, as I will show later. Uh, what's important here is that we want this set of principles to be able to evolve over time because you know, 10 years from now, nobody may care about services and, and hosts anymore. We may have come up with something better, okay? and I don't know what it is, and it doesn't really matter because the architecture will be able to adapt. So I'll give you a very quick example of how this works. Suppose uh, we want to retrieve a web page. The way this could be done is by saying, look, maybe the uh, Alpic CNN, the CNN service may be in fact replicated. And so the network may have a bunch of cho uh, choices about which service instance will deliver the content. One of these uh, services will return uh, a front page uh, and it will use a, black, uh, a blue arrow which basically responds to host-to-host -to -host communication to, to ret return that uh, front page. It has a bunch of in embedded objects which can correspond to services or content or other things. And so now the, the, the host can basically um, use services or content identifiers to, to, to retrieve the remaining uh, pieces of the front page of, of, the, of the service. And different um, um, uh, components in the network can basically deliver them depending on who happens to be in the best position to do that. And the network plays a key role in, in making that happen. So content in this case can be opportunistically cached as is suggested here. And so I, hopefully this, this quick animation will give you the main idea. The second uh, piece of the puzzle is that we want to support evolvability. And as I mentioned earlier, this involves basically um, um, being able to evolve the set of principal types. So the key challenge here is that um, whenever you uh, introduce a change, the question is who is going to uh, be modified first, applications or endpoints? And this is a traditional chicken and egg problem in the sense that there's not much of an incentive for one to change if the other one hasn't changed yet. So the particular proposal that we have is based on a concept called fallbacks. So in this particular case, let's imagine that we have a host-based uh, internet and we want to add uh, uh, content identifiers represented by CIDs. Uh, an application can send a packet like that, but it's likely to get in trouble because there will be routers in the internet that don't support CIDs. So they're going to drop the packet and the application is going to fail and whoever wrote the code is going to be in trouble. Okay? So what we propose instead in XIA is that addresses can in fact have multiple identifiers um, uh, as part of the address. In, in this particular case, besides the CID as a destination address, there is also a f an old-fashioned address consisting of an aut autonomous domain identifier and a host identifier, which basically identify the host using a well-established uh, addressing format. Okay? 
And so any router in the internet can basically fall back to that particular address if it doesn't recognize the first one, the CID type. So it's a very simple idea. So um, in specifically in XIA, we implement this using, uh, using DAG-based addresses, which is a little bit of a stretch, but is actually quite intuitive. Uh, here I have a destination address that consists of just a CID. Suppose I'm a router and I don't recognize, I don't know what that is. I'm 10 years old and I have no clue what this is. So what I end up doing is, there's a second part of the address which corresponds to the, to the, to the, to the second part I had in red on the previous slide, which effectively corresponds to an autonomous domain identifier and a host identifier shown at the bottom here, and that's the fallback part. So edges here are basically being followed by routers to, as they forward the packet, and we have solid edges, which are the primary edge and fallback edges. Any router in the internet can basically, uh, if it doesn't recognize the, prim the prim priority edge, it can fall back on the, on, the, on, the, on the fallback edge and deliver the packet using those well-established identifier types. That's the key point, okay? And you will see this later in the demo as we, as we uh, show that. The final part of XIA is basically intrinsic security. Uh, and this is that uh, each principal type or communication based on each principal type has some uh, intrinsic security properties associated with it that allow you to verify certain properties of that communication operation, okay? And so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this is actually largely relying, relying on earlier work, such as uh, the um, um, uh, AIP, the, the Accountable Internet Protocol. The thing you will see in the demo is actually uh, an example of intrinsic security for content where the identifiers uh, associated with content are hashes of the content themselves, so the destination can verify correctness. And then finally, I want to emphasize the kind of how these three pieces fit together. So I've explained three ideas that are being explored within the context of XIA. Basically, as I hope I've, I've been able to briefly explore, each of these three ideas has value in their own right. Okay, so each one of them you could actually implement independently of the other, and you will get some benefit from this. On top of that, by combining these three ideas, we get additional value. So an example that I will pick out is that by having flexible addressing, by, uh, no, no, by having multiple principal types, and we combine this with flexible addressing based on DAGs, we can actually evolve the set of principal types. If we had just flexible addressing types, that would still be useful, but we couldn't evolve it. So basically, the flexible addressing adds evolvability. Okay? And so we are now in, 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 the, in the process of basically uh, uh, moving these ideas further and evaluating them. And so now I'll hand it over to, to Matt and David who will actually give you the demo. All right, thanks Peter. Um, so as Peter said, I'm David and this is Matt. We're both PhD students at Carnegie Mellon working on XIA and we're really excited to get to show you XIA running on Genie this morning. In particular, there are four things we want to show you today. First, we want to show you uh, one example of evolvability in XIA. Secondly, we're going to show you an example of intrinsic security in XIA. Third, we're going to show you a way we can deploy XA on top of IP networks. And fourth, just for fun, we're going to show you our Wireshark plugin. Before we dive into the demo, I just want to uh, briefly describe our topology. We sat down and thought hard about the most interesting topology we could think of, and a straight line uh, seemed to be the answer. So we have four nodes running on Genie. Uh, two of them on the left here uh, are the nodes in Japan that Mark talked about. Uh, and then on the far right, we have a host at Carnegie Mellon, which is going to be uh, uh, talking to our Genie topology. And really quickly, I just want to extend a, a big thank you to Mark Berman, Rob Ritchie, uh, Shu Yamamoto, and Aki Nakao for helping us get this set up. They were very instrumental. Um, so for our demos today, we're going to be running a web server on a node in Tokyo. We're going to be running a web browser on the node at CMU. And I want to emphasize that these are native XA applications. They're written in Python on top of our, uh, Python, our XA socket API. Uh, and they, these applications do not understand IP. They speak only XIA. So let's dive into the, the first thing we want to show you, which is how XIA supports evolvability. So imagine, uh, imagine our network and the routers are, are fairly dumb. They only understand the host principal type and the domain principal type. So uh, this, this network basically functions as an IP network would. You know, an IP address is essentially identifies a domain and a host, and that's what the host and domain principles do in XIA. But some clever application developers have developed a web browser and a web server that actually want to use a new principal type, the content principal type, uh, to exchange uh, web pages. And so we're going to show you that we can actually uh, run our web server and our web browser with the content principal type, even though the routers do not understand what content identifiers are. And the way we're going to do that is uh, with a DAG. So 
we would, the web browser would like to send the following DAG into the network just with the, the identifier of the piece of content it wants to retrieve. But if it does so, that first router there that only understands hosts is gonna drop it. So we add fallbacks. When that router sees this DAG, it says, I don't know what a content identifier is, but I do know what domain and host identifiers are, and I can forward your packet. So uh, we're going to transition to a web browser here and uh, give us one moment to restart the visualizer. It's been a little finicky. <laughs> All right. So we're going to load, we've loaded actually a copy of the XAA homepage onto our XAA web server and we're going to load it using the DAG we just showed you and there it is. So we just loaded this using a content identifier with host and AD fallbacks over a network that only understands hosts and domains. And so let's load one more page just so you can see it again. And uh, you'll notice on the visualizer we're seeing spikes of content going across. So we're, we're, we've got end-to-end -end connectivity using content, identi content identifiers even though the routers don't understand them. And now we've loaded another page. Uh, and so, uh, all right. So that's, that's all well and good, but if application developers start using new content, or sorry, new principle types, I mean, what, what's the benefit? Uh, if none of the routers support them, do we need to wait until all of the routers support a new principle type before we can actually see any benefit? Uh, another way to say that is, what's the incentive for an application developer to start using new principle types? And what we're gonna show you next is, you can actually get uh, immediate incremental benefits uh, for upgrading even just one router in your network to understand a new principle type. And so what we're gonna do is upgrade the router in Houston there to understand the, uh, the content principle. So we're gonna give it a content cache as it sees content go by, it's gonna cache it, and later when it sees requests for particular CIDs that it has in its cache, it will uh, respond with those directly. So we're gonna go back to our uh, XAA page, and we're going to load up another page We've upgraded the router in Houston to understand content. All right, so you see the spike of content traffic going all the way across from the web browser, or sorry, the web server in Tokyo to our host at CMU. Now Matt's gonna reload that page, and what you're gonna see is you're only gonna see traffic on the link between Houston and CMU, because Houston understands content, and it has cached it. And so you just saw the purple line get big and fat, and now you see a, spike, a second spike of content uh, on the Houston CMU link, but not on the other links, because that router now understands the content principle and it can respond with the data from its cache. And so that, uh, in a nutshell, is evolvability in XAA. And I would love to explain it more, but we need to move on to the other things. So we're going to now show you uh, a simple example of how XAA's intrinsically secure identifiers can be put to use. So just a reminder of what Peter explained, uh, intrinsic secure, intrinsically secure identifiers um, mean a different thing depending on the principal type. So a host ID is the hash of the host public key, a service ID is the hash of the services certificate, and we're gonna focus on content today. A content identifier for a chunk of content is the hash of the chunk of content itself. And so what this means is in our example of a web browser fetching content, it will send a request into the network for a particular content identifier. It's going to get back a chunk of data, and it can verify that it received the correct data by hashing that data and comparing it to the identifier that it originally requested. And if there's a problem, it can alert the user or, or do whatever it needs to recover. So we are going to demonstrate this to you by uh, making the router in Houston malicious. It is uh, periodically going to respond to content requests with the wrong content, and you're going to see our browser will catch this. So let's go back to the XAA page. We're gonna load up another page. Um, this one uh, actually has some photos on it from our GEC demo, uh, GEC 12 in Kansas City last year. And so you see we've got a couple pictures. There's Matt up on the top, and this is Dong Su, another PhD student on XIA. Uh, and all right, so we've, we've loaded this page, but we're gonna refresh. Aha, the router has responded with the wrong photo. And now give it just a moment. Uh, we're, so this is, this is running on, on the host at CMU, I should have mentioned we're using an HTTP proxy. Uh, and so things are a little slow, but a box is going to pop up any moment now that warns us that, we, uh, that we've received the, the wrong content. 